Sometimes we feel helpless, individually and collectively. And yet, when we pray, we are touching heaven itself, God with all his unlimited power. So let's take prayer seriously. God has put us in a family. Therefore, you need not bear all your burdens alone. Those in your cell group, or if you have prayer partners, when you're going through a difficult patch, tell them and pray together with you. And you see how heaven's power will be released on your behalf. That hymn reminds us about all the troubles we go through, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So let this week of prayer fast and remind us of the tremendous power that is released when we go to God in prayer. To him, nothing shall be impossible. Whether it's personal needs, whether it's your family needs, whether it's your, the needs of the church, the needs of the nation, or global situations, let's take advantage of this week of prayer and fasting to make prayer number one in our lives. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence and pray that you will quieten our hearts and our minds so that your word may come to us with freshness and with power and with great conviction to accomplish in each of our lives that for which you send it. So cause the word to come alive to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever sat down with an open Bible and asked God to open your eyes to see the hidden faults in you? I believe it's something we don't do often, but that's precisely what the psalmist was asking God to do. He, he was a brave man to sit in the presence of God and say, God, open my eyes to see the faults in my life. God in his mercy doesn't show us everything at once. He shows us just one thing, and when we deal with it, he moves on. But he prays at the end of the psalm, Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. It's something we need to do often. I happen to be on many platforms on WhatsApp, and yesterday someone asked a question. Do we need to confess our sins? Should we confess our sins when we sin? I thought that was a strange question anyway. So I just quoted 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then different people wrote different things. And then he came out with why he had asked that question, because he had heard a preacher say that all our sins are dealt with. So we do not need to go back confessing our sins. But here was this man, the psalmist, saying, God, open my eyes to see the sins in my life, that you may deal with them. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. It's good to have a preview of the whole psalm before we look at verses 13 to 18, which we are looking at today. It divides neatly into six verses. Verse 1 to 6, 7 to 12, 13 to 18, 19 to 24. In the first stanza, he says that he knows, God knows him through and through. There's no hiding from him who knows every thought every word, every deed, God's omniscience. It can be a frightening thing that God knows everything about me, but it can also be a very comforting thing to know that God knows me as I am. He knows my strengths, he knows my weaknesses, and as he guides me in his way, it's according to what he sees of me. So if he brings a trial my way, it's, it's not out of to create problems for me. He knows me through and through, and he knows I'm able to bear it. 7 to 12, he states that he cannot go where God is not. There is no hiding from him. He can't escape God. Not even the darkness offers a hiding place. Speaking of God's omnipresence, again, that can be a very comforting thought, that wherever I go, no matter the danger, God is with me, and he's going to see me through. 
as the writer of the Proverbs states, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. There's nothing about me I can hide from God. He knows it all. And this is where confession of sin comes in. And when we confess God, we're not telling him anything new. He knows it. But we say, now I see it. And Lord, will you please deal with it? And it's not a once for all experience. There are people who don't talk about sin at all because they say it's all been dealt with. But we need to go to him again and again for cleansing. And then 13 to 18. God knew him even before he was born. God's interest in him began long before he was born. He's known him from the very formation of in the womb. And in the last paragraph, he talks about his zeal for God, which sets him against all who hate God, as well as a final plea to God to examine him and confirm his devotion. So God knew him from day one. That's what we're looking at today, verse 13. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God's intricate and extensive knowledge of him, as Pastor pointed out to us the first Sunday, began before birth. It began in the womb. His conception and his development as a fetus was all God's work. His inmost being, which he asked God to examine, was carefully put together by God. It was a purposeful, painstaking work. He compares it to knitting. And those who knit know about the intricate patterns that there are and the different patterns that one can create in knitting. And that's what he says God did. It was like a woman taking the trouble to do some knitting and doing it intricately with different patterns. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I don't know how much anatomy the psalmist knew. Probably not too much in his day. Things have developed a lot since then. But he described the final work as fearfully and wonderfully made. He's describing the inside, yes. But he's describing the outside also. That is no different. I wish that one day we can ask Prof. Lawson to illustrate the truth of our being fearfully and wonderfully made as he illustrates it from anatomy the way we are formed, the way we are able to move together so beautifully, the way we can take in different liquids, and I'm speaking as a chemist, and yet there are no violent chemical reactions in the stomach. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. When I think of all the things that could go wrong in this body, I marvel that we are well, so well most of the time. You know, my wife is an eye doctor, and when I look at one of her books, talking about the diseases only of the eye, I'm amazed. And you can do the same for every part of the body. It's a marvel that we are well so much of the time. God has made us wonderful and fearful. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 2. When Adam set eyes on the woman Eve for the first time, he broke into poetry. The first poem recorded in the Bible is a man admiring a woman, fearfully and wonderfully made. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Genesis 2 and 23. Fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist seems to say, I can only look at what you have done with awe and wonder. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. He goes on in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Even at that stage, he was not hidden from God. Secret from everyone else. One could only see the woman growing bigger and bigger. But what was going on inside, no one knew. Until the day of birth, 
And then when it's announced, we all rejoice together, bouncing baby boy, bouncing baby girl. And my usual benediction, may their disturbed nights be few. That is when we see the, what God was doing in secret. And it's marvelous in our eyes. In verse 13, he spoke about God knitting him together. But verse 15 talks about being woven together. So think of kente, whether Pertoy kente or Bonyere kente. The different colors, the different patterns, each beautiful, each different, each the work of the master weaver. And that's what we are, fearfully and wonderfully made, crafted by the master weaver. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. What others could not see, God could see. And what was to be the span of life that was ordained for him, he also writes about this. This could mean the length of time from conception to delivery. But it could also be the span of life sovereignly determined by God, as God illustrates in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God's knowledge of us goes even before our conception. And sometimes the, port, the task ahead are portioned for us. In the case of Jeremiah, to be a prophet are determined even before we are born. Some of you may have read about this Nigerian lady whose favorite activity was destroying Bibles. She would collect them, whether buying them or whatever, and she would go and burn them. The thing she hated most was to see Christians looking very happy. But that was her roommate in university, always singing chorus and rejoicing. One day she came for a prayer meeting, put her Bible on this young lady's bed. And when she came, she got very angry. Who put this Bible on my bed? Roommates removed it with apologies. She got so angry, beat her head with the Bible and tore it to pieces. This Christian lady went on her knees, lifted up the torn Bible and said, called her name three times and said, this Bible you have torn, you are going to preach from it. Amen. She insulted her. But you know, that prophecy came to pass. God revealed himself to her, and today she's a flaming evangelist. God knows these things even before we are born. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So it's God who determines the things that we are to do. That's, what <clears throat> That's why we are not to boast about the things God gives us to do, nor be jealous of what God has appointed others to do, because it's all under his sovereign control. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I suggest he means that what he has been saying in verses 1 to 16, the fact of God's omniscience and omnipresence, the fact of God's interest in him from before he was born, when he thinks of these things, he just can't understand, he can't explain. Does it not amaze you that God has such interest in you? Not so that he must find fault like Job thought, but that he might do you good. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Romans 8 and 32. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. It's as if he fell asleep meditating on these truths of God's unwavering interest in him. And then when he woke up, he found that he was still in this divine presence. God was still with him. God in his omniscience knows me through and through, and he knows you through and through. And that should be of comfort to us. The things he allows to come our way are the things which are suited to what he knows of us. God in his omnipresence will never let us out of his sight. 
wherever we go, even in the midst of danger, he is with us. And this interest in me began before I was formed and will keep me from falling till I'm presented faultless before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. And what great assurance this should give us from day to day. God is interested in us very deeply. He's interested in our progress. He's interested in everything that we do. He wrote about his sitting down, his rising up. God's interest is all-encompassing, and that should be a great source of encouragement to us, not only this week, but throughout the year. He goes before us, and he is present with us in all things. As we get to a close, there are some thoughts I would like us to meditate on in the course of the week. First is God's, God who supervises our formation who had an interest in us even before we were born and continues to have an interest in us. And this interest will continue until he gets us to heaven. He will never let go a hand. He has saved you and he will get you to heaven. I know one doctrine which sometimes causes difficulty for some Christians is once saved, always saved. There are some who reject it saying that it makes us lazy. If you read Romans 6, you will not say that. Anyone who understands clearly why God has saved him will not be lazy. He works out his salvation with fear and trembling, not work for. That was settled once and for all. He works out. He cooperates with God in traveling the way to heaven. And nobody who really understands what it costs the Savior to die will be careless about our salvation. Once there was a an awakening, a revival in the school, and a young lady came to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The transformation in her life was so clear, her mother, who had known her from birth, could see that my daughter is different. One day she went home crying, and the first question her mother asked her was, have you stopped reading your Bible? And she had. She was not working out her salvation. So she slipped back into those days when she would cry about anything. And the question she used, she used to ask in those days is, once saved, always saved, or can a Christian lose one's salvation? Her thinking was, if I can still make it to heaven without too much of a bother, then let me just ask you to slide into heaven. It doesn't happen that way. You've got to cooperate with God. He who has saved us will keep us the very end. He will not let go a hand. His interest in us will not stop till he who supervises our formation gets us to heaven. Second, this passage we looked at this morning, 13 to 18, speaks to us of the dignity and sacredness of all human life from conception to natural death. There are organizations like the International Planned Parenthood Federation, Mary Stokes International, which seek to provide abortion services, especially in poorer countries and in poorer neighborhoods in the U.S., and often seek to influence governments to relax laws on abortion. Recently, I got an email from a group called Citizens GO, and it's asking us to write to the Speaker of Parliament in Malawi where a bill is now before Parliament to relax the laws on abortion and usually have very powerful interests. There's a member of this church, a medical doctor, and at one time, this question of abortion was very paramount. There was pressure in the press everywhere. And one person came and said, I know that you are against this. He knew him as a Christian. And he knew that there was no way you could push him to accept some of those things which were being taught. The Lord, by taking an interest in us from before we were born, teaches us the sacredness of all human life. And we are to seek to live this way in the way we treat people and so on. Thirdly, I have a responsibility to take the best possible care of my body. If God has been interested in me from the very beginning and has made me what I am today, it's in my interest to take the very best care of this body. 
one thing which sometimes I find a bit alarming is how much we dwell on our responsibilities, on our privileges as Christians, but talk so little about our responsibilities as Christians. God has saved us, yes, but what for? Not just so that we'll get the good things of this earth, which he often gives freely, but so that we may be about our Father's business, and that we talk very little of. People want to get rich, but rich for what? Rich so that we may promote the work of God. A few years ago, we bought some four bicycles in this church out of our mission fund for some pastors in the north. And one of them rode 50 miles into Burkina Faso to go and preach the gospel, one bicycle. That's what God wants us to spend some of our money for, promoting the work of business. We have a responsibility to take the best possible care of our bodies so that we may be in the best position to serve God faithfully in this life. That's part of the reason why he has saved us. And then may I say that it's a privilege to partner with God in marriage to produce the next generation and nurture them for God. This when speaking about pregnancy and the formation of the baby in the womb. And may I say it's a privilege to partner with God in marriage to produce the next generation. Listen to what God said to Abraham. For I have chosen him so that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the will of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Abraham will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. And I say it's a privilege to partner with God in producing children and training them to live for God. And husbands, may I suggest that you make your wife's pregnancy a joint journey. She carries the load. Yours is to fast and to pray and encourage her every step of the way. Knowing all the things which could go wrong, you stay in the background as it were, and you fast and you pray and you encourage. It's a journey together so that we may raise the next generation for Jesus. And lastly, how do you like what you see when you look into the mirror? Do you complain about your ears? I've had people tease me all my life about my ears. Or do you complain about your nose? Or do you tell yourself that you've been designed and fashioned by God and that you are fearfully and wonderful made so that you praise him for whatever he's made of you and take pride in it? Let's look into the mirror and praise God for what he has done for us. And as we enter this week of prayer, let's remember one of the things that's come out in this time is that God is near and he's interested in us. So let us make sure that we spend time in prayer. I found that one of the ways the devil attacks us, which we probably are not often aware of, is by bringing fear. Anytime you're afraid, know that the devil is attacking you. Turn to what you've learned today that God is near. Be gone unbelief, be gone fear. My Savior is near and for my relief shall surely appear. So let this week of prayer remind us that God is ever near. And no matter what happens, we can turn to him in prayer. Shall we pray? When God speaks to us, I believe it's important to respond along the lines that he has spoken to us. What has God laid on your hearts this morning through this exposition? Something to confess. Maybe you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see and you've been complaining. Can you now remind yourself that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, intricately woven together by God, that you are beautiful in his eyes, that he created you for a purpose. Maybe you've been negligent in looking after your body in the best way possible.
will you now determine to do the best you can for this body that God has given you so that you may serve him better. Married couples, will you see yourselves as being partners with God in producing and shaping a new generation for Jesus? So that you want, <clears throat> so that you want to make time to spend with your family and instruct them in the things of the Lord, not leaving to the Sunday school teachers. Husbands in child producing age, are you seeing your pregnancy in the family as just a matter for the woman or are you making it a joint journey together? Being partners with God and producing new life. But maybe as we've talked about these things, you know that you have not made Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. May I remind you of his interest in you even from before you were born. Many of us can look back and see how God in his love and wisdom brought us to a point where we confess Christ as Savior and Lord. He has that same interest in everyone. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never made him ruler of your life, this is a good day to do so. Ask him to come into your life, to cleanse you from every defilement of sin, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, to give you a new mind, a new body, a new spirit, and to live to bring praise and glory and honor to him. Lord Jesus, you know the desire of every heart here this morning and everything that we have brought before you. We thank you that you are able to do for us over and above what we ask or consider possible. So hear the prayer of each heart and do for us over and above what we have asked so that in all things your name may be praised and glorified. Amen.